We have Phoebe Seaton here. She's from uh, the Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. She's both a co-founder and co-director there. And prior to working there, she worked uh, directed the Community Equity Initiative at the um, California Rural Legal Assistance. And she worked on critical infrastructure and service deficits for low-income people and community communities in California, as well as issues on, uh, related to water and land use. Um, Caroline Farrell is the executive director of the Center on Race, Poverty, and Environment. She works in the Delano office and assists low-income communities and communities of color uh, in the South San Joaquin Valley and throughout the country in the struggle for environmental justice. Um, we also have Juan Carlos Cancino. He's with the California Rural Legal Assistance, and he also works um, the Community Equity Initiative. Uh, he went to Stanford Law School. Also. <laughs> And then we have Michelle Anderson. She was a professor. Uh, she taught a little bit of my class here last quarter. And well, I think a couple of us took. It's fantastic. And she uh, is a professor at Berkeley right now and also works for Shuma Holly as an environmental uh, law fellow. Um, so thanks so much for, to all of you guys for being here. I'm going to be the moderator today. And to get us started and to sort of warm everybody up because it is um, a sort of unusually early hour Saturday morning for people to be coping with content. Um, I would suggest that we do a quick exercise, which I love to do as a way of introducing people to the Central Valley who aren't familiar with it. How many of you have spent time in the Central Valley? Yeah, two. Okay, good. Well, you can um, uh, enjoy these pictures. Um, I think everybody will enjoy these pictures. Um, so what I want to what I want to do is um, is let you guys read the captions to these out loud. They will, um, I will uh, um, flip the slides. Um, is it is it too small for you to read out loud? Okay, I think it's wonderful to to read them. Some of the captions are just a single city name or a place name. They're not usually cities. Place name um, with a date, so that you can just read that and um, and go on. Um, and so we can start with Lucia up to Sophia and sort of wrap around. You're not out of this game, right? <laughs> and start over again. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, and it just, yeah, it, it's a, um, yeah, I think it's a, a nice way to introduce some people to the um, so, uh, so early morning. Early morning. Oh. All the glitters is not gold. Or, or I can't tell, I can't pronounce that word. Or it's Sorry, it's so it's so simple. Simple. <laughs> During certain times of year, pesticide applicators are required to notify beekeepers within a one mile radius of their targeted spraying areas so that hives can be moved away. In most cases, however, human residents receive no such notification. So, is it too Larry? Yeah, and yeah, no pronunciation, we don't care. You're going to mispronounce <laughs> lots of things, don't care. <laughs> Phonetics are good. <laughs> and hydrochromia is pumped into unlined irrigation canals. Provides nitrogen to the crops and also seeps into the groundwater in the Central Valley. <laughs> Merced County, uh, the California aqueduct carries clean mountain water through the Central Valley to Los Angeles. Farmers are allowed to use the water for irrigation, but local drinking water comes from often polluted wells. Facility of California tap water samples. I'm on the old sky here, so I'm really having problems. <laughs> tap, tap water samples from the small towns around this uh, cellula. Their contents, their contents, nitrates from fertilizers and from mega dairy cow manure. Next, next word. There's no way I can pronounce it. <laughs> a pesticide ban in 1977, but still present in groundwater arsenic. Some of the water smells like. Sleep. Thank <laughs> you. 
Plain View, California, food without pesticides. Early Mark, California. Teresa de Ava stands on the narrow strip of dirt and road that divides her home from the fields next door. Pesticides regularly drift into her yard and home. In 1999, a toxic cloud of metam sodium drifted into her neighborhood from a nearby potato field. Residents were evacuated after vomiting and suffering other signs of acute poisoning. Stanislaus County. Uh, heavy air pollution creates beautiful sunsets in the valley. Here, the sun sinks behind the, the coast range, usually obscured by smog. Wasco, California. City, California. Alejandro Alvarez touches the image of his daughter Ashley, which was tattooed onto his arm after her death. Ashley was one of a cluster of children born with blood palate and other birth defects in Kelowna City and neighboring Avenue. She died when she was 10 months old in January 2009. Residents fear that the hazardous waste land Elements 
city of California. General Petroleum Avenue and Standard Oil Avenue are two of the main roads running through the residential park of Carolina City. This gives you a, a topographical uh, slide of, of the Central Valley so, so that folks really have a sense of, of um, the area that we're talking about. And a more descriptive sort of map from a regional point of view is that the Central Valley refers to these inner, the turquoise Sacramento Valley and the purple San Joaquin Valley of California as distinct from the coastal regions, the big metro regions of the south, the eastern regions of the Sierra Nevada. here today are all um, working in the San Joaquin Valley where, um, where most of these um, issues are, are, um, are strong. And, um, and this is just, um, you know, part of the purpose of this panel is to, um, I think, part of my purpose for participating in this panel is to, um, and to encourage all of you to remember the Central Valley as you think about human rights in the international context, as you think about, um, as you think about environmental law, as you think about poverty law. Um, the Central Valley, it's interesting, um, several of the advocates that I know to work, who work in the Central Valley, including Phoebe from North Carolina as well, and including Laurel Firestone, a major water, um, uh, uh, access to water lawyer in the Central Valley, began their work because they were committed to doing international human Rights, and they realized that they could do international human rights um, a few hours away from LA and, uh, and um, San Francisco. Um, this is a little bit of an overview of the things that make work in the Central Valley so compelling. And I want to say just a tiny bit about each of these. Um, first, on poverty. Um, census 2010 revealed that Fresno, Modesto, and Bakersfield are three of the five highest poverty metropolitan areas in the United States. So the urban conurbations of the Central Valley are exceptionally poor. All of the counties of the San Joaquin um, Valley have poverty rates of at least 20%. So that means that one, at least one in five people, and actually more like one in three people in parts of the Central Valley, live below the federal poverty line. And to give that some context, the federal poverty line is $23,000 for a family of four. So one in five people, if not um, one in three people, are living um, below that, that line. Um, tremendous poverty. In the rural areas of the Central Valley, it is even high. You get median incomes of ten to $20,000 for full households with children. Um, and, uh, and on air quality, um, you got a little bit of a sense of it from the slides. But apart from Los Angeles, for reasons of topography and um, and the use of land in the Central Valley. Apart from Los Angeles, Central, the Central Valley has the worst air quality in the entire nation. So asthma rates and the <coughs> physiological effects of, of um, extreme uh, air pollution are um, very, very severe. Um, the diesel emissions are exceptionally high, the dairy and industrial emissions are exceptionally high, and methane and ozone, ozone are exceptionally um, uh, exceed uh, air quality standards. On water quality, um, there's very, very severe contamination of water quality in the Central Valley of groundwater. Um, 
the major cities of California draw their drinking water from, uh, from the Sierras. They get fresh snow melt that comes into the Bay Area water systems. And to a certain extent, um, the Los Angeles metro area is also pulling eastern snow melt or pulling Colorado um, uh, surface water. In the Central Valley, residential, some ag users pull from those same sources, but residential users in the Central Valley generally pull from groundwater. And groundwater is extremely contaminated in the Central Valley for sort of two main reasons and a number of sort of secondary reasons. The two main reasons are fertilizers and pesticides. Um, it is the breadbasket of the world, is, or of the country, as many of you know, enormous intensity of, of industrial scale agriculture and um, the uh, intensive use of fertilizers and pesticides. You add to that a number of, of industrial installations all through the Central Valley, some of which you saw in these slides, but it's not even the tip of the iceberg. Um, there are industrial sources of water pollution um, and a, a drastically inadequate waste disposal systems, which means that there are leaf leaking septic systems that are entering into groundwater sources. Um, so there have been, some of you have probably seen it, there's been a lot of coverage in, um, in major American newspapers, including the New York Times, of the scandal that is drinking water in the Central Valley. It's one of the most um, uh, serious drinking water quality issues in the country. Um, there's sort of a separate issue of toxics, which overlays both of those, but it's also freestanding. The fact that each of the three class one facilities that accept the state's most toxic hazardous waste are in the rural part of California, and two of them are in the San Joaquin Valley. And they're all situated in close proximity to high poverty uh, Latino communities. Um, but then Central Valley uh, residents are, and those, those areas have been, those landfills have been cited for um, various uh, environmental violations, accidents, and so forth, um, but also are, um, are a very deep concern for um, penetrating, uh, for reaching groundwater sources. Um, uh, the Central Valley uh, residents are also particularly vulnerable to toxics for many of the reasons you saw in the slides, um, because they inhale it in their work as farm workers, um, because pesticide plumes um, move off of fields and drift into residential areas, because they're exposed to their water, et cetera. So you get this sort of compound um, chemistry of toxic exposure in the high poverty communities of the Central Valley uh, that is extremely um, dangerous. Um, uh, next is housing. The Central Valley has lots of the same kind of housing issues that have hit the um, urban areas of California, including uh, very concentrated subprime lending and, and, um, and extreme rates of foreclosure. Stockton was the, had the ignominious distinction of being the foreclosure capital of, of uh, the country, um, and it is now in municipal bankruptcy largely as a result of, of that foreclosure crisis and the boom and bust of the housing market there. Um, but there are also a lot of special housing issues in the Central Valley that really come from its role as a, um, as a rural area with intensive agriculture. There are a lot of mobile home parks, there's a deep need for seasonal and temporary housing, um, and there are very, very severe habitability issues. Habitability issues that make um, the habitability issues in, in urban areas um, look modest by comparison. Um, on the um, on labor violations, um, these uh, and this is a lot of CRLA's work as a legal aid organization deals with these and the housing issues. A lot of this stuff. Um, labor violations include both um, very uh, severe concerns about the enforcement of workplace safety uh, regulations, everything from access to water. Um, while you're, part of, while you're um, for farm workers during the heat of the summer, to access to, um, to uh, bathrooms for workers, to uh, pesticide exposure in the fields, um, on and on. Very serious workplace safety concerns, but also really basic and quite egregious wage and hour violations of people that are simply not paid by subcontractors, um, they're, under, they're paid under minimum wage, uh, et cetera. Um, to, basic uh, wage and hour law. Um, there's a lot of need for, um, for that work there. 
access to health care and in this also government benefits. Um, government poverty programs, it's harder for them to penetrate into <coughs> rural areas. It's harder for them to sign people up for benefits. It's harder to find eligible persons. So we have very low rates of penetration for access to things like food stamps. Um, but in addition, there are the sort of healthcare is a freestanding problem. There's not enough medical facilities. The density of, of physicians and medical access to medical care is as poor in the Central Valley as its access to uh, legal services and lawyers. Um, indigenous languages of Central Valley's um, enormous and just beautiful sort of heritage as this sort of um, as this portal for migrants to the United States means that the region has a very wide range of, of languages represented and it makes, um, it creates particular service challenges for, um, for uh, legal aid organizations, medical aid efforts, um, and so forth. Um, the cities down there, I've already mentioned how poor they are that, and their, um, and the sort of boom and bust uh, cycle of their housing markets across the, um, the 2000s. Um, but these, uh, the cities uh, are also some of the most compelling uh, places to think about sprawl in California. They are the sites of massive greenfield conversion to residential subdivisions. So if you want to have a real fight about the future of land use in California, as Phoebe will introduce you, a lot of that work takes place on the outskirts of Modesto, Fresno, and so forth. Um, and as very pertinent to my work now, it, because Stockton is the largest bankruptcy in American history outside of the city of, municipal bankruptcy outside the city of Detroit, it is actually the front lines of municipal insolvency and a, a, a extremely important and compelling test case of what municipal services um, will survive uh, a, um, a, a, a fiscal crisis. Um, last, it, the last two um, unincorporated areas are the areas that are not within a city's <coughs> boundary. They lie um, outside of municipal territory. So unincorporated areas rely on counties as their um, and uh, and I will um, show you just one slide to um, really just a pair of slides to give you a sense of some of the um, the uh, equitable concerns about the way cities grow in the Central Valley. Um, this map is the boundaries of the city of Modesto in 1961. The hatched area, the blue, is the city boundaries. The um, orange, the darkest orange, and the lighter orange are areas that are, um, are predominantly Latino, 50% or more Latino. And this is what the city of Modesto looked like in 1961. This diagonal line that you can see kind of cutting the city is Route 99, and we can sort of think of these areas to the um, southwest as, they, um, as the sort of Latino region. This Route 99 actually used to be a segregation line in Modesto's history for Chinese and Chinese laborers in the Central Valley. Um, it was actually a, a de jure segregation line for um, the for licensing to Chinese laundries, um, and it became and sort of as the Chinese population turned over to become Latino agricultural workers, that segregation line persisted. So just this next slide gives you a sense of how Modesto grew over the next 40 years. This is the 2004 urban boundary. You can see that the city grew to the northeast, pulling in greenfield sites. Big subdivisions, open land, lost farmland. The city did not pull in um, the area to the southwest. Why does that matter? Because with cities come um, access to municipal services, including wastewater disposal and water, um, just water access which means that areas to the southwest of this line have been dealing with um, rural infrastructure systems, even though they are part of the urban conurbation of the city of Modesto. They are part of Modesto's urban life. If you were to walk around, you wouldn't notice anything except the fact that the sidewalks and, and the storm drainage and, and, um, and they are uh, no longer on um, street, uh, they're no longer um, part of the legal city. 
Um, and just a couple of slides to give you a sense of the service disparities. Um, these little blue boxes here are county islands. That means they're unincorporated little islands that are otherwise surrounded by Modesto. The red dots here are street lights. Um, so what happens at night? These areas are dark. Dark areas attract crime. These areas become the sort of vessels of urban crime in the city of Modesto, not only because they're so dark at night, but because um, the, uh, the Modesto police do not serve them. They're drawing on county police that have um, longer distances and um, um, slower response times to 911 emergencies. Um, same deal with respect to water. Most of you won't be able to see these little blue lines, but I'll just tell you what's here up close. These purple boxes are those same four neighborhoods. There are what there's a water network of Modesto water lines that is crossing this whole area. It's actually crossing under the streets of those four neighborhoods, but they're not allowed to tie in to those um, water lines. Some of this is changing because of the work uh, that these folks have done, um, uh, but, um, but that was the picture of it in 2000. Same with respect to sewer lines. The blue areas have these red um, main piping systems that are running right under their streets but they're not allowed to tie in because they're not residents of the city of Modesto. The, um, and the most painful irony of it is that the sewage processing facility sits right in between, basically right in the middle of those four neighborhoods, so they get all the odors and um, nuisance effects of proximity to that sewage plant, but they rely on septic systems that are decades past their expiration date and um, lead to, um, to the flooding of raw sewage in these, um, in these neighborhoods when there are heavy rain events. If the soil is saturated, these lots are too small to have septic systems, and, um, and uh, the, um, it, it's a, a, a public health uh, disaster, not to mention a humanitarian one. Michelle, yes, what, can you go back to that? Yes. The, um, also, the, the wastewater treatment facility is equidistant among those four. Mm -hmm. So it's right, it just kind of really shows the yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's right in the it's right in the middle of the I took out the slide that has it drawn in there, but it's right in the middle of these four. So they can't send their wastewater to it, but they're its neighbors. Um, this is storm drainage. This is one of the reasons why the lack of, of wastewater is so serious. This is um, essentially a floodplain area of Modesto, but there are no storm drainage systems, which means that during heavy rains, the water pools on the surface of the city streets, and, um, and it sort of mixes with contaminated soil. So, it, um, so people come into contact with it, with it which is sort of the way you get um, the public health threat of, of um, uh, non-processed uh, sewage, um, and uh, um, but this really gives you a sense of this sort of network of storm of storm facilities that um, that uh, are serving an indistinguishable residential community, um, but there are legal boundaries that are separating um, the um, the included and excluded residential areas. Um, uh, so that's the, that's, that gives you a little bit of a sense of the unincorporated um, areas problem of sort of islands or, or um, areas of, um, of, uh, of uh, the um, urban fabric that are cut out of sort of basic municipal services. And the last point I wanted to make was access to justice. I think Juan Carlos is going to say a little bit about it, but suffice it to say that about um, we as a legal aid, it, Federal legal aid dollars concentrate in metro areas. Per county, the, um, the federal legal aid dollars in, um, in the metropolitan areas of the state of California are about double what they are in the San Joaquin Valley, which means that if folks like you don't bring your private funding for your fellowships and whatnot, there will be fewer lawyers in the Central Valley. The funding streams for poverty lawyering weaker in rural areas in general, they're particularly weak in the Central Valley, um, and, uh, and so the sort of redirection of private resources to um, poverty lawyering in the Central Valley is particularly important. Um, and uh, nonetheless, I would really, oh, anyway, that's where I'm going to, that's all I want to say for now. Um, so, uh, so with that.
Um, hi everyone. Um, I'm Juan Carlos Vincino. Uh, I work with California Rural Legal Assistance. I'm a staff attorney there. Um, I'm going to sort of keep my remarks um, limited. I want to talk about um, CRLA uh, and, and sort of its place in rural justice um, really briefly to introduce you to it um, and then quickly about uh, our community equity initiative, which is focused on uh, the unincorporated areas issues um, that M Michelle just described, um, and some of the some of the strategies and um, and, and barriers that uh, it's working uh, to address. Um, and then I think I, I hope that will set up sort of uh, my co-panelists neatly um, to sort of talk about uh, plan how planning and governance um, is failing failing really to, to achieve rural justice for, um, for a lot of our clients. Um, so just to, to follow up on what Michelle was saying, um, it's not only federal legal aid dollars, but really lawyers who concentrate in cities. Um, most of us, um, um, and I think it's probably true of most professional, like most professionals, but um, certainly lawyers uh, tend to um, group in cities. Um, <laughs> There, um, you know, th this is sort of a fact that, um, that, that um, you know, talking point that we use a lot to sort of describe the, the the magnitude of the gap, um, the legal services gap in rural places. But that uh, there's one legal aid attorney for every ten thousand people, approximately, uh, in California, um, and uh, and one in thirty thousand for um, for farm workers. So. You know, we're doing, there, there aren't enough of us, um, needless to say. Uh, and, and what's sort of shameful about that is that, um, you know, legal, California Rural Legal Assistance um, and, and Legal Aid really got started in the 60s, mid-60s with the War on Poverty. Um, and, you know, by the 70s, it uh, was really sort of having an impact. Um, today, we have fewer legal aid attorneys. Uh, uh, I think it, we can speak generally, but certainly at CRLA than we did in the 70s. Um, serving a much greater population. So um, things, uh, so when we talk about rural justice, the, um, the landscape, um, at least in terms of uh, services to individual clients, is really worse today um, than it was in the 70s. Um, so uh, with that, um, I just wanted to introduce you to California Rural Legal Assistance, which is um, the legal aid program that I work for. It's um, we describe it as statewide. Um, sort of our uh, offices stretch from the border, uh, so from El Centro and Imperial County, um, north to Marysville, um, so up north of Sacramento. Um, we don't serve the far north of California um, in any direct way. Um, we're also one of the, I think, the largest legal aid uh, outside of largest rural legal aid serving the state. Um, we are in all of the places where um, agriculture is sort of biggest um, and, uh, and, and really fiercest. Um, so the San Joaquin Valley, uh, the Salinas Valley, um, and, and south to uh, the Imperial and, um, and Coachella Valleys. Uh, so that, those are our service areas. Um, our mission, um, and this was recently rewritten, but um, it's really sort of the way that we think about our work is to fight alongside um, uh, sort of most exploited communities of, um, of the state um, for both, um, you know, community justice and, and individual rights. Um, our vision is for a rural California where all people are treated um, with dignity and respect and guaranteed fundamental rights. Um, so this is really, in that language I just wanted to share with you, it really sort of harkens back to um, our beginnings in, in the war on poverty. Um, and I think that a lot of the lawyers, we have a lot of um, lifers uh, at, at CRLA, and I think, I think the ethos is really still um, one of a war on poverty. They haven't sort of, um, despite kind of being in the game 40 years and, um, and, and, and actually seeing some backtracking in um, a lot of ways, in our commitment to rural justice, they sort of remain, um, you know, the, the goal is still to um, do away with rural poverty. Um, uh, some other um, quick notes I wanted to make about CRLA, um, just to give you um, a better sense of the, the scale of our operation, um, 
where you serve over 39,000 uh, individuals annually through our offices across the state. Um, you know, those offices, the number of offices uh, um, ranges from 16 to 21, depending on kind of where funding, we've, we've had to sort of um, close offices in the last uh, few years, um, but I think folks have every intention of, you know, if, if should, should money um, uh, increase again of, of reopening those offices. Um, but, you know, um, also to give you a sense of what it is to, to be a rural justice lawyer, um, and, and again, of that gap, a lot of our offices are one and two attorney offices. Um, that's, that's a sort of a lonely job, um, especially given the, the magnitude of the need. Um, uh, so, um, priority areas, I think Michelle sort of, you, you see a lot of them up there, but our sort of big priority areas um, are thought of as uh, education, housing, uh, labor and employment, uh, and health. Um, and then, um, and the, those are really sort of commitments that we made uh, when the organization was first formed um, and through um, a series of, uh, of priority setting conferences. Over the years, uh, we've sort of reaffirmed our commitment to those issues as, as issues that just are continuing issues um, and, and really sort of the, um, you know, really the biggest issues uh, facing um, rural Californians, poor, poor rural Californians. Um, we also, though, have, um, have a commitment, and I think this really comes from um, uh, our, our rural roots, um, a commitment to serving the most marginalized. Um, so it, it's, it's already um, isolating uh, and, and uh, to, to be poor. Um, and um, again, to be poor in a rural place. Um, and I think then there are even sort of further um, stigmas and challenges that people face. Um, and to, to address those types of issues, um, for example, um, the LGBT community in, um, in our rural service areas or um, indigenous migrants, so, so folks that don't even speak um, Spanish as a, um, their, their first language. Um, or people living in unincorporated areas, so just with, with um, county governance, um, those that we, we've set up special initiatives um, that are really focused on driving services to those communities that we believe to be the most marginalized among um, among our client populations. Um, and then finally, the last thing I'll say is that there's a CRLA's model, and this is really a model of legal aid, but I think that uh, CRLA has a particularly strong commitment to it, um, of a mix of direct services and impact work. Um, you've probably heard a lot about this in, in different classes here at the law school um, about constitutional rights and other ways of doing, um, providing legal services to, to the poor, but um, we, you know, the, the model is that we want to service and, and really our responsibility is to serve individuals, um, you know, in, in sort of eviction proceedings or um, wage and hour violations or with other compl individual complaints. But um, you know, because the the mission um, is to is really to alleviate poverty um, and to um, make impact on that scale, we um, we leverage our uh, our scope, the sort of scope and geography of our offices to identify um, issues that are showing up across uh, the state. Um, so when we see individuals walking in with the same types of complaints um, in three different places, um, all hundreds of miles apart, um, you know, that, that suggests uh, uh, that there's something larger going on. And um, Sierra Lake devotes uh, half of its sort of uh, resource to impact cases. Um, so, so to trying to make um, kind of those big class-wide impacts. So that's CRLA. And then I wanted to talk briefly. I work on the community equity initiative at CRLA, um, uh, the project that Phoebe formerly directed um, and is now sort of partnering with um, through a new organization. Um, and that is uh, the community equity initiative is focused on um, uh, addressing sort of the unique challenges of uh, poverty in unincorporated areas. Um, so I want to briefly talk about those and um, some of the other aspects of the project and then um, kick it over to, um, to Caroline and Phoebe. Um, so quickly, CEI, um, uh, 
uh, was established in 2007, so it's not an old project. Um, we've been at it about five years, six years now. Um, it was a part. It was formed as a partnership between CRLA, um, so where I work, the Legal Aid, um, a sister foundation called the California Rural Legal Assistance Foundation, which was formed to do legislative work um, related to the types of issues that uh, CRLA is focused on, um, because we're restricted as a uh, sort of federally funded legal aid from doing legislative work, among a num number of other things. Um, and then Policy Link, which is um, a, a national, sort of nationwide um, uh, policy uh, and research uh, group. So th those were sort of the, the partners that formed the CEI. Um, and the mission um, uh, from the outset was to address and eliminate social, political, and environmental factors that negatively impact um, unincorporated areas, disadvantaged unincorporated areas specifically. Um, yeah, so I, th I, I think that um, what's sort of what was remarkable, um, well, there are a number of things that I think are pretty remarkable about the initiative, but um, but I think uh, among those, maybe chief among those, is that it really um, looked at the problems um, in unincorporated areas, and and rather than just being about uh, targeting sort of bad things coming into these communities, um, it took kind of a, um, I think a more proactive approach uh, um, to, to um, the deficits that we were finding in these communities, and um, instead sort of has directed its work um, at improving those conditions. Um, so bringing, drawing resources into those communities, good, the, the kind that you want to come to um, your community. So, you know, investment dollars in, in all the things that are missing um, right now. So, you know, pipe sewer systems, clean water, um, really basic, basic um, amenities of, um, of modern life. Um, and I, I, I guess I would just say um, about the CEI also that um, it was geographically limited. So the project started in the San Joaquin Valley um, and, um, and has since, you know, since expanded to the Eastern Coachella Valley. Um, but CRLA is really committed to seeing uh, its work eventually filter out to all of its, um, its offices. But it, you know, it's really intensive work. Um, I think Michelle, in a, in a class of hers I was visiting a couple of weeks ago, described it as, um, as providing wraparound services to these disadvantaged unincorporated communities. Um, and I, I, I hadn't heard that um, before, but I think that really um, neatly describes what it is um, that CEI does and really what's different about it. So we go in and we'll provide, like, we're not focused on any, um, sort of the issues that we face in, in any given community, um, while they're all directed toward improving infrastructure and services in those communities, the, the variety of those, um, of the is issues and deficits um, and, and really the solutions is, um, has proven un unlimited so far. Um, so, um, quickly, just to, to talk about disadvantaged unincorporated communities because they're really at the heart of um, our work. Um, there are hundreds of these places across the state, um, hundreds. And uh, despite that, um, and really um, a, a very significant number of people living in these communities, they've largely been invisible um, until I think it's safe to say that this work started um, about five years ago. Um, and, the, and the initiative has really been focused on generating information about these communities and their deficits um, and getting them mapped. And so when we talk about, um, you know, I was asked to talk some about, um, you know, our, our strategies and non-litigation strategies, I think, in particular, um, because litigation does form an important, a, a very sort of the backbone of um, our work. But um, a lot of this work has been about community education but really education more broadly. Um, so generating information that we could share not only with our communities, but with their governments um, and, uh, and sort of the larger populace. So putting these places on the map. Um, because I think, I think what we find in sort of a lot of rural justice issues is that there's just there's an invisibility. Um, that's really the chief barrier. Um, uh, you know, I would describe um, as my as sort of the last time I described the barriers and uh, chief barriers to 
improving living conditions in, in these communities um, as three. Um, and really, those are information, uh, funding, and governance. Um, and the way that I talk about what's sort of missing in each of the, or, or, or sort of what the, the challenge is in each of those is too little, too little, too fragmented. Um, so there's too, too little information. You know, we don't know enough about these places. Um, there's too little funding because funding, um, the state wisely, in some sense, um, directs its funding towards things that it can see and know. Um, and so if there's, a, if there's no information, there's no funding. Um, and so a, a big part of the work, the work has been generating information again through not just sort of like statewide mapping and really um, pretty sophisticated geographic information systems, but also community survey work. So door-to-door -door work um, that we do in, in um, such a way that agencies can, um, can accept it um, for something real. And then, and then governments. And um, you know, I, I um, encourage all of you to, um, to take a local government class. Um, um, and I would say Michelle is if she were still here, but um, you know, that the, the, these communities, and really what's different about them, what, what sort of makes their poverty unique in some ways, um, is the fact that their most proximate government, the people who are supposed to sort of be generating information and planning for them and funding kind of the issues that the information surfaces, um, it's county government, it's not city. Um, so they share it with cities. Um, their uh, counties are built to do certain things and, and to not do others. Um, among the things that they don't do well is provide um, infrastructure and services, although there are a lot of people living out in these places, um, in these communities at basically urban densities. Um, so good governance um, uh, is a real issue um, because it's both distant um, not well built to provide what these communities need and also really fragmented um, across like water boards and the county and um, you know services districts so um, that's just to paint the picture and um, I'll leave the rest because I think I think I got assigned with my time um, if I'm running um, but to talk about kind of the details of that work what the campaigns look like and the communities that we're working that's all I'll say thanks uh, so I'm Caroline Farrell, I'm the Executive Director at the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment. Uh, we were uh, founded in 1989, so we're coming up on our 25th anniversary, and we uh, started as a project of the California Rural Legal Assistance. So, and Juan Carlos was an intern of ours, so this is all a very, uh, I don't know, a very close network. We sort of spawn each other. <laughs> so, um, I'm trying to spawn you. <laughs> so it's, so it's, a bit, it's addictive once you get involved with rural issues, you just sort of stay involved. Um, and so our mission is to achieve environmental justice and healthy, sustainable communities through collective action in the law. And we have three ambitions with our work. One is to build individual capacity. Um, so that people entering into campaigns with us leave with more capacity than when they started. Um, the second is that we build the community's power vis-a-vis -vis decision makers. Um, and then the third is that we actually address the environmental problem that they're coming to us with. Um, and so it's sort of a building power and addressing the environmental issue. If we do one and not the other, then we haven't really succeeded. Um, and so, and sometimes if we build power but we haven't addressed the environmental issue, we still claim we succeeded because that's really the key is the building power. Because as, as Juan Carlos was saying, the system of governance in the valley isn't really designed to meet the needs of the most vulnerable people. And I would go so far as to say that many of the decision makers in those, in those positions of power are not connected to and do not feel accountable to the farm worker communities that they run. Um, and so for those reasons, building power is really important because one of the things that our organization focuses on is, 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 is creating systems change. We want to address some of the root causes that are affecting these issues that, that poor communities in the Valley are dealing with. Um, and so I thought I would tell you a little bit about um, our, uh, the dairy campaign um, that we have been working on for 15 years. 
um, because I think it illustrates a lot of the tools that we use. Um, it's also the very first campaign that I worked on. Um, so I graduated from Golden Gate in 1999, and I moved down to the Valley. Um, so first job right out of law school. And I knew I wanted to do environmental justice law. Um, there weren't a lot of jobs in the Bay Area, so competitive, but there was a lot of need, and there was a position open at the at CRP in our Delano office. And so I said, I'll do that for a couple of years, learn something, and then I'll go uh, somewhere else. And so 15 years later, I'm still there. And um, I still have a lot to learn <laughs> before I can go anywhere else. Uh, so I think that that was a really exciting campaign because I was the only environmental justice lawyer in the Valley at the time. They've since multiplied, fortunately. Um, and what it allowed me to do is really take charge of the campaign. I wasn't second chair to somebody else. I mean, I, I had a, a boss in San Francisco who was teaching at Hastings and on sabbatical, and I was doing this campaign. <laughs> so uh, there was a lot of responsibility in the very early days. And so what the campaign was, it started in 1998, and actually it began um, based on research that law school interns were doing for us over the summer. And it was, we had gotten a tip from some farm worker um, community members that we had been working with in corporate that Boswell, uh, J.G. Boswell, the big cotton uh, king of California, um, was going to build a five, five dairy complex that was going to house 55,000 cows near Portland. That didn't sound good. Um, 55,000 cows live right near a low income farm worker community that was already suffering from bad air and bad water. Um, and the Kings County, which was the county government that, that oversaw Portland, um, just was not responsive to the community. So we had done some public record act requests to get some information. Interns had scoured that, come up with reports, so we understood what the, what the proposal was um, and what the county was doing about it. Slipped into that was information about a 28,000 cow dairy operation that was going to be proposed for Kern County. And so then we learned about that. And there was a former community in Arvin that we were working with. And we were like, did you know about this? They said no, but they were very concerned because they're downwind from that dairy. And 28,000 cows seemed like a lot. And this was part of a growing trend in California where dairies were moving from the Chino Basin because they were being pushed out by housing development. And the regional board in that area, the Santa Ana Regional Water and Quality Control Board, was, was coming down with, with regulations that if you had a certain size dairy, you needed to take some sort of regulatory measure to reduce contamination. And so they were moving to the San Joaquin Valley because we had a lot of cheap lands and not a lot of regulation around environmental issues. Uh, so we were seeing a, a proliferation of these proposals of big dairies of over 1,000 cows, over 2,000 cows, over 10,000 cows. Um, and the counties were not requiring environmental review. Kern County said that under the California Environmental Quality Act, you were exempt because there was no possibility of pollution. And I was like, you have 28,000 of anything, you have a possibility of pollution. <laughs> you know, it's like, that is crazy. So we began a campaign around, well, litigation around, you need to follow CEQA. And we actually won that case, and they did an environmental impact report. And that became a really important organizing tool because now we had information. What are the impacts from theirs? And we thought the big issue was going to be water. water. And it was a big issue because nitrates and the application of fertilizer and the manure lagoons. Um, but it was air quality that was the biggest impact. We learned that all of the gases coming off the dairy and the air pollution of moving silage all of those things were going to be more impactful. And so we began an organizing campaign around giving information um, to community members. Also, um, 
working with experts to identify what types of medication might be appropriate. Um, and what that also stimulated was because we were beginning to talk about it, now the dairy industry began talking about it. And so before, they would just do whatever they, they didn't, I mean, whatever, we're the dairy industry. So we don't have to do anything. So, but now they actually had to come out. So we were starting to engage in like debates and we were getting Sierra Club members supporting farm, farm workers. And we were getting like other advocacy organizations like uh, the, the National Sierra Club and uh, Earth Justice to also provide some legal services and some expert services. So we were able, because we were building this kind of momentum, we were able to attract more resources from, from other more resourced groups. Um, and we were beginning to change the debate. And what we learned in doing this was that dairies were not were exempt from California's Clean Air Act. So all of our plans did not, did not include dairies, did not include agriculture at all. Um, and so that raised a constitutional problem because California had a weaker Clean Air Act compliance than the federal statute. So it was a supremacy clause problem. So we sued US EPA, who had been allowing the state to submit plans that exempted dairies. And EPA was like, oops, you caught us. They settled the case, and uh, we, and then California had to pass a regulation to, uh, to regulate dairies. And that became a big organizing campaign. So we organized community residents to go to Sacramento and talk about their experience living near large scale industrial ag operations and what kind of protections they needed. And during this time of these local campaigns around individual dairies, we had begun to capture the attention of legislators for good or for bad. And some bad, one initially bad, it was bad at first, but then we turned one of them. We turned one of them who had, it, it's a funny story actually, Dean Flores was head of the Ag Committee, and he called a legislative hearing in Hanford the like, seat of dairy development, um, and kind of grilled our executive director, Nicole. Um, it was like, it was, oh, it was brutal. But from that legislative hearing, they demanded some more information about what the ammonia impacts were going to be from dairies. And they thought there weren't going to be ammonia impacts. So when the state came back with their study, lo and behold, there were a lot of ammonia and um, he, he changed, over the course of that information gathering and those pressure points, um, he actually, Dean Flores actually became our champion on air quality. And he actually is the one who put forward the bill that required um, California to regulate agriculture in SB 700. Um, so that, that was a great victory. But just because you win doesn't mean you're done which is what we learned uh, many times over, but particularly <laughs> in this case where you, uh, now the air districts had to pass a rule regulating dairies. And the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District, which is the regional body that oversees air quality in the eight region, in the eight counties of the San Joaquin Valley, was now debating the rule. And that body was made up of all elected officials from the cities and counties that had been underrepresented uh, to the folks who were working with. And they didn't want to do anything because the, the, the Valley has this mentality that, that environmental regulation um, stops business and we're a poor community, so we need all the jobs we can get regardless of what it impacts on. Um, and so that that kind of ideological problem of we don't want to regulate versus we need regulation to protect communities um, is something that, that has been a constant struggle. It is why we need to develop more kind of people power around these issues. Um, but so a lot of our advocacy then focused at the Air District to sort of create the scientific basis but also the political basis for making the change. Unfortunately, the rule that they've created is one that 
kind of codifies existing practice, which, but we still have some of the worst air in the nation. So what, how is that reducing impacts? I mean, it's not. So it's kind of a rule that doesn't, doesn't really do it. Um, and so we're fighting about that. <laughs> we're suing the air district, we're suing EPA when they approve rules that allow that to happen. The biggest problem that we face around Clean Air Act advocacy is agency deference. So agencies receive a lot of deference for what they do. So that is a big obstacle and why, again, community organizing to create the political pressure to make the changes by political officials is really important. Um, and so we're still in the midst of that. And now what we're seeing is um, a movement in the, in, amongst valley groups um, that it's not just policy and it's not just litigation and it's not just community organizing, but now it's voting, citizenship, electoral politics, and how do we get more kind of uh, packed money, how do we get more 501c4s, um, how do we, how do 501c3s comply with electoral law, um, how do we make a more accountable um, voting system so that when people do get to the polls, they're not disenfranchised. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a different, you know, there's no shortage of issues, but there's also no shortage of strategies, uh, which is kind of, and we see the evolution as, you know, it, it, it's a nimble area of practice because, you know, you kind of, you, you get some, some, something moving this way, and then they try and slap you back. So then you gotta go over here, and then they try and slap you back, and then you gotta go over here. But you keep moving forward, you just feel sometimes like you're moving sideways. But you just sort of, you know, it's not, it's not a direct path. Um, and you've gotta, you've gotta use all the different strategies in your toolbox. And I think the dairy campaign was one area where we kind of evolved our practice and saw that you know, at times the legal strategy was out front, and at times the organizing strategy was out front, and the idea was that each would open a window for the other, and you just needed to be prepared to, to step into that space. So, that's my, that's, those were my uh, thoughts. Thank you. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Should we go through the pictures again? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Phoebe Seaton uh, with Leadership Council, and I was in CRLA for um, uh, eight years, and working with Juan Carlos and, and others there on the Community Equity Initiative, and recently tried to um, steal Caroline's sort of three-pronged message about building capacity and power and, oh, and environmental issues. But it was I didn't want to face Caroline in litigation over <laughs> so we um, we decided to, to to tweak a couple of the words, but to go with the same formula. And, um, we, um, so I want to rip a little bit off of, of, of what folks said. One of the things that I'll be doing this weekend is do Monday is actually a petition to the um, the state board on the regional water quality. So the way that a lot of these regulations work because there's a state level board and then the regional boards make decisions and the, you, you have to appeal to the state board before you go to court. So the regional water quality control board in, the, in San Joaquin Valley um, just passed a new order on how to make um, protect groundwater from dairies. And they say in their order that all of, of many, many, many existing lagoons were um, manure is um, is currently contaminating the groundwater, but it's really expensive to do anything about that, and maintaining the dairy industry is really important. So we're not going to look at the economic and environmental costs of people who are impacted by that drinking water, and um, and because they have to basically do this cost benefit analysis about continued degradation, and they did one half of the analysis and not the other, um, and so we're challenging that decision and we're saying it's not. 
terms of just to kind of round out, I guess somewhat round out the dairy dairy fight and the, the impacts on groundwater. So if anybody wants to work on that, um, let me know. I'll, find, I'll, try, I'll try to find your library right after this panel. So one of the um, one of the campaigns that I wanted to talk about is um, trying to bring all of this together, and it's a land use campaign. And the basic premise is let's invest our dollars, invest our energy, and invest our planning in existing communities. And the focus in large part has been on the unincorporated areas, which um, is, is um, you've seen today and maybe we've seen in other places, have been largely left out of planning, left out of information gathering, outside of investment, but also in, our, in, our, in, a, in a lot of our inner cities, in our, in our core, there's been a lot of disinvestment um, while the um, development has gone in Modesto, northeast, in Fresno County as well, northeast, a little bit northwest, and um, we're really focusing on this emerging practice area and land use of smart growth. And do all of this, does that mean anything to you? Smart growth. So smart growth was in large part, I mean, it's probably been codified for a while, but SB 375 was one of those like, major legislation a couple of years ago that um, mandated local agencies to create these plans that make transportation, housing, uh, and land use conform. So you're doing all of these things in a coordinated fashion. You're directing your transit and transportation dollars to where there's going to be housing, housing and jobs. You're making sure your land use is in line with that, and um, and then you're making sure that there's, uh, in theory, you know, adequate housing opportunities for people of all income levels, kind of in line with that. And that what we're seeing is, or, or what was actually um, codified and keeps and it's, keeps getting stronger and stronger is that this smart growth framework is very, very, very um, focused on urban growth and dense growth in ways that are most relevant to very urbanized areas. Not even Modesto, not Bakersfield, a little bit Fresno, San Francisco, Sacramento, and Los Angeles, and San Diego, where it requires um, very um, high capacity transit. Um, um, buses that go every 15 minutes during peak hours, which I think there's one place, one neighborhood in Fresno. It's the only neighborhood in the San Joaquin Valley where you have that kind of bus service. And certain densities that you just don't get in, uh, in the San Joaquin Valley and other rural areas. So what you're seeing is at the state level, these whole regions are left out of this framework. And then at the local level, um, I'm going to talk about some of the local political framework. Um, as well, but at the local level also there's a heavy concentration on geez, the state is telling us that we have to invest in the urban areas, so we're not we're certainly not going to think out of the box um, and um, we're going to do the bare minimum of what's required if that, and so we're going to we're going to put all of our you know, growth in this area or at least we're going to tell them we're going to and the low income areas, the small cities and unincorporated areas are not going to benefit at all, are not going to be part of these plans because we're really worried that if we show we're growing, the state's going to say no, and and and, um, and besides that, which is what I'm going to get into in a second, there aren't any developers that want us to plan and direct funding um, in some of those less disadvantaged areas, and therefore, really, why would we do it anyways? So, um, are you all, are you with me so Okay, um, so I want to talk a little bit about our citywide work, but really focus on our work in Fresno. So in Fresno, they're developing this term planning framework, which is called a sustainable community strategy, that's showing where there's going to be growth. Um, and I'm playing with my phone because there's two, there's one email that I got last night, and one letter to the editor that was um, printed today, and I'm trying to figure out how to get them both in. I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'm going to do a first thing because they bullied me so I couldn't do any PowerPoint presentation. So, we'll get a picture. This is, this is, this is like Fresno County, and this is, this is really good. This is, 
definitely more accurate than that. Phoebe loves drawing. She's actually been making this. Chris, I was the only county in America to be a perfect rectangle. Oh, and then she's, yeah, there's a coastal range and a shale. And here's the mountains. Anna. Okay, so this is not actually sort of important. There's sort of what else Anyways. So they kind of are looking at, um, these are small cities, unincorporated areas, actually, to distinguish them. The dots are unincorporated areas. This is a bit. <laughs> 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 and this is on tape, a bit like this. Thank um, <laughs> you, my portfolio. <laughs>
in the next couple of weeks, we've, uh, or in the last couple of weeks, we've been going to government saying this is stupid. Both of these things are stupid. Putting out, putting new development out in the middle of nowhere while well, you have kind of communities languishing in need of development. And creating this almond orchard where you, you should have housing at the same time as you're creating a whole new development somewhere else, same size, three and a half miles to the north. So my colleague, Veronica, who couldn't be here today, um, went to the city of Fresno and was like, on the SES, this is crazy. You have these legacy communities, which, um, which, which are unincorporated communities that have been in the community, that have been contributing to the economy and the culture for years, and yet you're concentrating all your growth in the city and, allow, and, and kind of condoning this new development out in the county. And they're like, legacy communities are not viable, there's no tax base there, they're gonna die out, they're not, but what, you know, forget, I know that they're important to you, but forget them. And um, Veronica is super, super sweet, except when she's mad, and then she's not sweet at all. And the mayor, she was talking to the mayor of Fresno, and she was like, this is, are you crazy? These communities have been there for 70 years, they're farm workers, they're what's generating the economic base. Um, and and they're, it's really important to invest in the communities to protect that farmland. And you know, they've been there, they've been contributing, you just can't say they're going to die off. And so she's like, okay, I heard what you said. Um, so I'm going to read you what the city manager just wrote to this governing body that is going to make a decision on the SCS. Um, we ask that you create new policies um, in line with the Kind of the beneficial interests of all residents. And then he says, please contribute to the transit, invest in transit in the city of Fresno. And then he says, when it comes to growth in unincorporated areas, there is a recognition that legacy communities play a key role in supporting production agriculture, and that the county should prioritize funds to study options for addressing water, sewer, infrastructure challenges in unincorporated communities rather than in new towns. So like, you know, this is huge. Granted, the city is really leveraging us to say, don't grow out the county, grow here. But it is really amazing that the city has taken on this new view of the importance of, um, like, of investing in legacy communities. Now, the city doesn't quite see eye to eye with this on allowing the almond orchards, but I just wanted to, um, uh, Larry, the editor, just came, came in from one of our board members who says, the B Sunday front page article on developer Darius Asemi's plan to further Fresno's sordid history of racism, sprawl, and corruption was very disturbing, yet all too familiar. From the developer who employed a city council member's wife and uses a lobbyist convicted of aiding and abetting extortion to especially tailor a zoning amendment and a de facto redrawing of the general plan, it's all here and we've all seen it before. This should be tagged Operation Rezone Redux. Um, City officials need to split apart this intentionally completed ordinance. I'm talking about this, this farming ordinance. Um, combining th these two different ordinances, one of which I didn't talk about, but um, I will afterwards if you're interested, um, serves only the developer's desire to force through his amendment while everyone else debates restrictions on gardens, drowning out the concerns of West Fresno residents, specifically toxic exposures from industrial agriculture for economic development in our region's most heavily burdened community. Um, the, um, sec da -da -da -da. Secondly, City Council Member Clint Olivier should recuse himself. This proposal is the next step in his coordinated effort with Darius Assigny to undermine Alternative Bay along with other members of the City Council to the upcoming general plan update. They are attempting to redraw the map by removing 360 acres of viable residential land and about 20 years of more just unjustifiable sprawl. And that's that. See, I did work it in. And, um, and that's, I think, man, I'm out of time. But I could keep drawing. <laughs> 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 uh, thank you, Phoebe. That was great. Thank you very much.
densely populated areas. So it incentivizes investment in densely populated areas that don't, for the, for the most part, definitely don't exist in um, the San Joaquin Valley and certainly don't exist in the more rural areas. Is that better? Yeah, I, to answer that question also, it's sort of more big yeah. picture level, something I've learned from Phoebe over, and, and from Sierra Lay and CEI over the years is that there's a real problem at the state legislative level that Democrats represent the big urban areas. to sort of fill out the picture is that it was, I mean, it was written by, um, it was written for cities, um, and, and really the idea was that you want to limit um, vehicle miles traveled by putting everyone, like the things that people drive to close to them, including jobs. The thing that's different about rural geography is that people's jobs aren't in cities. Um, a lot of times they're out um, where we're growing things, and so those legacy communities are actually, um, historically sort of farm worker communities or sort of agricultural labor communities and um, they fit the strategies in some sense um, if people would only open their eyes um, and, and sort of recognize it. So that, that's just to say that, um, you know, I, I think that SD 375 really sort of does the smart growth. Um, it uh, makes sense in rural places. You just have to um, make sense of it. What, if any, kind of programs are to deal with the impact of various pesticides on both the farm workers and also their, their families and children? Is, is anything going on in that area? Um, well, there are, there were a couple of things. Um, so early on, after some of the big pesticide drift incidents that happened in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a bill of SB 391 that was passed, and that required uh, an upgrading of emergency response plans in areas that were at risk for pesticide drift. Um, there was also, at that, in that same bill, I think a mill tax that was applied to pesticides. Um, so when uh, an applicant would purchase pesticides, portion of that would go into a fund, and that fund was supposed to reimburse people for medical expenses if they got sprayed on and had to go to the hospital. Um, but that fund, there's been a serious breakdown in how that fund has actually been used. Um, and then in the later, two, like 2006, 2007, um, there was a campaign among several different communities um, to get agricultural commissioners to create buffer zones between where pesticides are sprayed and where um, and and, and uh, how houses and sensitive receptors of like a quarter mile buffer zone, um, and and so that has been in place in Kern, Tulare, Madera, and Stanislaus counties, I believe that buffer zone, and then because there was a, a lot of negative publicity around and a lot of drift that was happening um, and getting in news, newspapers and fines were coming down from the Department of Pesticide Regulation. The ag community itself created a spray safe campaign and it was particularly active in Kern County where it really looked at what were the best practices around application. And since that program came into place, there's been a, a reduction in the number of drift incidents, um, the, the severity of those drift. So there's been some, some work on, on uh, to try and get better emergency response when there is an incident, some type of reimbursement mechanism, and then there's, there's the buffer zones to try and prevent um, drift from happening. I think we need a lot more, and there is a lot more, um, uh, there are better efforts now at, at scientific research on the chemistry in farm workers. Um, body, sort of the, the, the cocktail of exposures that are going on. There's a huge project um, through UC Berkeley in Salinas that is testing farm workers over a very long longitudinal period to actually 
look at, at, um, at cancer exposures and, and really think about um, think about uh, protecting farm workers um, over over the long run. Um, uh, and then there are also there, you know, a lot of this is about science and regulation keeping up with industry, which creates new methods of, of, of you know curtailing pests and, and fungus and you know other sort of um, threats to agricultural crops. Um, and so there's always a kind of a dance going on of sort of science chase and, and regulations sort of chasing um, kind of, you know industry innovation in the in agents. Um, so um, so it's just to say that, that this is sort of a, a, an ongoing um, uh, issue because, um, uh, because science and regulation has to follow sort of the invention of new agents that are not listed chemicals and therefore not regulated in the same way as known harms. Um, and that there are toxic tort uh, cases against older um, uh, pesticides that were used in the valley for a long time and have penetrated groundwater sources, including TCP and, and yes, exactly. So there, you know, you have sort of scientific research, regulation, um, toxic tort litigation, um, and uh, you know, plus um, a whole host of other efforts to address it. I think one of the things that would be interesting for you folks is that the science is getting close to where they're actually able to show causation mm -hmm. and connect up genetic defects on a transgenerational basis. There's been a tremendous work, a tremendous amount of work that's been accomplished in the last three or four years. It is. That's right. There has been a lot of progress, but um, but causation in in these uh, in in tort-based lawsuits over toxic exposure for pesticides is still exceedingly difficult. You really have to sort of trace molecules in order to survive causation. Where, where they're going now is identifying biomarkers. Yeah, no, I know. I've seen that research. It is very, very exciting, but there are limited um, settings in which you can perform it at this point, and so it is sort of the front lines of, of the causation proof issue. But, um, but, uh, but as I understand it, there are limited, um, there are limited subs. There's a limited range of substances that carry those traceable biomarkers, so it sort of has some limits to it. But it is incredibly important. You know, from the point of view of, of plaintiffs, lawyers, and toxic tort lawyers who do that kind of litigation in the Central Valley, I think one of the challenges is simply the cost of sustaining these lawsuits and the expert witnesses and the enormous scientific costs of, of proven causation um, against uh, major um, industrial defendants who have enormous resources to defend those lawsuits. So, you know, the plaintiff's lawyers who bring those cases have to have investors, basically, who fund their cases um, so that they can invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in, um, in the lawsuit itself. So it's, um, anyway, it's a tricky thing, but that's part of um, the work that is going on in the Central Valley, I think. Mm -hmm. Fine. And if we need other questions, we can ask the church about that. Sure, thank you guys thank so you much.